So good afternoon. Uh, apologies for not being able to be at what uh, looks like it's going to be a very interesting uh, meeting and uh, group that's formed to tackle issues in relation to whelk fisheries. I was hoping to be able to share some of the um, scientific findings that I've been involved in over the last um, six or seven years based on work that we've done in Wales and the Isle of Man previously. Um, suffice it to say that uh, whelk fisheries maybe are not as straightforward as they look on the face of it for a number of different reasons and we'll explore those. So the science undertaken was undertaken entirely in the Irish Sea in the coloured areas that you see in this chart and also uh, down just off the south of the uh, Pembrokeshire Peninsula. So we're going to talk a lot about uh, length of maturity. So that's what this graph shows here. This shows how we estimate the size at which half of the population of whelks are sexually mature. This is what we use to uh, inform the size at which we set minimum landing size. So for this particular population of whelks, we can see that half the animals in the population are sexually mature at a size of approximately 59 millimeter shell length. However, that estimate has error associated with it, which is shown by the dotted lines. And if we had uncertainty in our estimate, as we do here, we might want to advise a precautionary minimum landing size at this upper confidence interval. And in this case, that more precautionary minimum landing size would be approximately 65 mm, uh, millimeter shell length. So the work undertaken in Wales was basically a uh, consistent standardized scientific survey working with four individual fishermen. Two of those fishermen were located in North Wales, one in Pembrokeshire and one in Swansea Bay. The idea here was to try and capture some of the geographic variation in parameters such as growth rate and then uh, length at maturity in the Wales wide population of whelks. All the fishermen were asked to fish with a standard uh, fish tech pot, which you see here in the photograph, and they fished these over a full uh, annual cycle so that we also uh, had some insights into uh, annual variation in growth rate and also the timing of the onset of sexual maturity. So these graphs give you the, uh, the, the key findings. These are the approximate locations where sampling was undertaken. So two locations in North Wales, one to the north of Anglesey, one in Carnarvon Bay, another one um, in the south Cardigan Bay, and then another one uh, in a couple of locations off um, Swansea. So you see that each of the fishermen fished in two locations. <clears throat> we'll just ignore this one because there was insufficient data. The numbers in each of the graphs uh, relate to our predicted uh, recommended minimum landing size for uh, each of these individual populations. What you see in North Wales is that it can be relatively high up to 76 millimeters shell length and that is the mean value, not the precautionary value. Whereas in the south of Wales, off Swansea, the uh, recommended minimum, minimum landing size or length of maturity is as low as uh, 56 or nearly 57 millimeter shell length. The other thing though, which makes matters much more complicated is that these two locations, both in Swansea Bay, are literally within 10 kilometers of each other and we see there's a very big discrepancy in the uh, potential predicted recommended minimum landing size a difference of 10 millimeters now clearly that has some quite worrying implications for spatial management and the reason for that is that if we apply a uniform minimum landing size across large regional areas that's effectively going to put certain whelk fishing grounds out of business or basically make them non-viable. What we have in these histograms is the data or the size distribution of whelks in each of those areas that we were looking at in the chart before. The dotted line was the minimum landing size at the time when this science was done. So that's around about 45 millimeter shell length. 
and the solid line here was uh, basically indicate what the uh, length of maturity would indicate that the minimum landing size for that specific location should be. Again, ignore this graph uh, just here because of insufficient data. So in this particular case, uh, we can see that uh, moving the minimum landing size up to the new recommended minimum landing size would result in only a relatively small decrease in catch. Whereas if we head down south to Swansea, we can see that a move from the current or the at the time uh, recommended minimum landing size to the minimum landing size that would be appropriate for that local population would result in 40% uh, of the catch uh, being lost. So what that means is if you have very locally based fishermen who fish specific um, grounds uh, and they've done, maybe done so historically for many years, changing the minimum landing size very suddenly or introducing a region-wide minimum landing size could uh, disproportionately affect some fishermen compared with others elsewhere. So this is why it makes life somewhat more complicated. Some of the other interesting findings I think you should be aware of that came out of the study was that uh, at certain times a year there is a propensity for sex overfishing. That's shown in this graph here. Basically what's happening is when female whelks spawn and they've lost condition, so sort of around about September, October, November, uh, going into December, they're then very hungry and they have a propensity, a greater propensity to uh, crawl into pots because they need to feed themselves up. So what we see is a shift from male whelks to female whelks for quite a prolonged period of time between January through to approximately June. Now that's a concern because of course females in populations often are the bottleneck because male organisms can produce a lot of sperm and they can do that very often whereas females only have a limited capacity to produce eggs. So there may be some considerations we need to make in relation to seasonal fishing activity. If we think about how well the current minimum landing sizes are actually performing, that's also of concern. So following the science we did in Wales, the Welsh Government decided to put the minimum, minimum landing size up to 65 millimetres. If we actually look at the L50s, though, across the different areas based on new findings that relate to um, uh, an important consideration of when we examine our whelks to study and see whether they are sexually mature, we see that the minimum landing size is only performing well for certain locations and is not performing well for others. What we see in the Isle of Man is that many of the locations in the Isle of Man have whelks which only mature above the current minimum landing size of 70 millimetres. Now I know there was a consultation and there was a discussion about increasing this minimum landing size, so that may well now have increased. Um, nevertheless, for a considerable period of time and elsewhere in the UK, particularly more widely in uh, England, for example, whelks are undoubtedly likely to be being harvested uh, at a size that is well below um, the L50 when half of your population are sexually mature. So in other words, uh, for those areas where we're not uh, enforcing these much larger minimum landing sizes, and even these in some cases are not adequate, um, there's a high probability that we are digging very deep into the reproductive potential of our population. There are also some secondary effects uh, that could affect whelks that you should be aware of. One of the things uh, that came to light during studies I was doing on bottom trawling was that despite their robust appearance, whelks can be quite sensitive to uh, bottom trawling activities, which would include scallop dredging, beam trawling. When we undertook uh, studies to examine the effects of trawling on whelk, we used uh, divers to uh, undertake surveys in sort of before and after studies, prior to fishing and after fishing. 
uh, counting the number of whelks that they found, whether those whelks were in a, a normal condition, in other words, crawling around on the surface, or whether they were being scavenged by predators, or whether they were uh, inverted um, and, and not crawling around, but just sort of lying there rather comatose. Basically, after beam trawling an area experimentally, we found that, yes, there were quite a large number of whelks in a normal condition, but a sudden big increase in the number of whelks which were being consumed by scavengers, and also quite a large number of whelks um, that were uh, basically inverted and immobilized. These are some of the pictures and uh, really quite informative. Um, the normal condition for a whelk when it's not doing anything, it will be buried in the sand, just poking its siphon out of the uh, sediment, filtering the water, tasting for odours of prey or carrion that they can feed on. So when you trawl an area, the whelks come out. For example, when you go potting in an area, the whelks will come out of the sediment, move towards the carrion. Now, if the whelks have been scooped up by a beam trawl or a scallop dredge, they will get rolled around. And because they have statoliths, a little bit like the ear stones that you and I have, they can become disorientated. So here we see an immobilized whelk lying on the surface of the sediment. It's produced a lot of mucus, which you can see coated in sand grains. And of course, this whelk is now vulnerable to being predated. Here we see one such whelk being predated by a starfish. So in normal circumstances, this whelk would actually have quite an active escape response, leaping across the sediment away from the starfish. But you can see quite clearly it's uh, unable to respond. It's what we call incompetent, and it's being subdued by the starfish, attracting in other predators as well. And here we see a hermit crab tackling, again, an inverted whelk, which is unable to respond and escape. So how we handle whelks is actually really quite an important consideration. And in some laboratory experiments, we simulated the type of um, disturbance or shocks that those whelks would be exposed to in a trawl, either dropping them in a consistent uh, fashion from a height against a hard surface. In other words, in, in a way that they might be unloaded out of a cod end onto the deck of a trawler. Or, of course, during normal um, sorting practices on board whelk boats, if they're not handled carefully and they're actually dropped onto hard surfaces, a similar thing could happen. And then we also simulated rolling. So in other words, where whelks might be rolled around in the belly of a fishing gear as they're towed around for a considerable period of time. And then what we do is a behavioral assay where we uh, take these whelks and we put them in tanks and then we expose them to a predator. And what we're trying to do is to see how many minutes it takes them to um, right themselves. So in other words, uh, to get them to uh, reorientate themselves and be in a position where they could escape from a predator. And what you can see is when you drop the whelks and when you roll the whelks, uh, those writing times actually uh, increase most considerably for the rolled whelks. They seem to undoubtedly to be the most disorientated. So although whelks look tough, you need to treat them carefully. So if we're thinking about um, how we handle our bycatch and undersized individuals before putting them back to sea, it would be sensible to think about uh, ways that you can soften the handling process. For example, screening whelks on rotating drums, I think, would be extremely counterproductive. Um, hand riddling whelks through fixed bars, to my mind, seems a good idea, but you probably want to see uh, a lot of flowing water and it would be even better if when they were riddled through those bars, they actually fell into a trough of water so that their um, impact was considerably softened uh, before they're then discharged over the side, side of the boat. So uh, hopefully that's some useful uh, food for thought. I don't think any of these issues are insurmountable, but I think uh, what it suggests to me uh, are a number of different ways forward. Possibility for area-based management with quite specific minimum landing sizes, but that raises the point of how would you enforce that. But given current technology, uh, that should be entirely feasible given sort of uh, barcoded uh, tags for whelk bags related to e-log books and things like this. Alternatively, if we're going to have a much broader geographically applied minimum landing size, well, that 
probably needs to be a lot higher and we have to accept maybe that certain areas of the seabed are going to be excluded from fishing activity because the whelks in those areas perhaps never actually attain um, a, a size that, that is commercially viable at suitable densities in those areas. The secondary effects of other fishing activities, which could have an impact on the whelk fishery itself, there's the issue of how we handle whelks, which we're going to discharge because they're undersized back into the sea. And then, of course, there's the other consideration, which is how do secondary effects of fishing, particularly from toad gears, impact upon the egg masses of the whelks, uh, which are resting on the seabed. So probably a combination of closed areas specifically designed to benefit the whelk fishery and protect the whelk fishery from other users in the sea is probably not a bad idea um, to add into the mix of management tools to consider. Anyway, I hope you found this a useful video and I really uh, do hope I can make the next meeting. I think this is a, a really excellent exercise and I wish you the best of luck today.